Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is our tea talk, and uh, today we have Cheng Zhang from uh, Canadian Institute for uh, Theoretical Astrophysics, CETA. Cheng uh, is a postdoc there, and Zhang will be uh, going to talk about the uh, CLMAP Pathfinder, uh, which a number of us at Caltech is also part of. So uh, please uh, take it over. All right, thanks, Junan. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but uh, the talk is basically exactly what it says on the 10. I'll be talking about COMAT Pathfinder. I'll be talking about early results uh, from the first season of observing. And I'll talk about some implications of those results for uh, probing uh, carbon monoxide line emission at high redshift. Uh, now, COMAP is a project overall that is trying to apply the technique of line intensity mapping uh, to studying high redshift star formation. And so I think it's important to start by contextualizing uh, basically why you would want to use line testing mapping to study star formation, uh, particularly uh, across the first several billion years of cosmic history to try and connect the dots of structure formation, star formation, galaxy assembly, and so forth without necessarily resolving individual galaxies. And then I'll talk in more detail about the signal pathfinder, the instrument itself, the survey design, um, as well as takeaways from these early science papers that we were able to publish uh, in July. Uh, now, let's first take a step back, and I want to talk about the big picture of taking pictures of astronomical fields, because telescopes have been just getting better and better um, in space, but also on the ground. Now, I'm showing Hubble here instead of, instead of JWST, mostly just because HST was really the first to popularize the idea of deep fields. The, the, the idea that you can just point your telescope at a patch of black sky and spend enough integration time and suddenly you end up with, you know, riches of distant faint galaxies uh, from early cosmic times. But of course, we can also do deep fields from the ground with instruments like ALMA. And this is actually quite important because, you know, by combining things like HST and ALMA, combining data in different wavelengths gives you different aspects of the same cosmic volume. So with HST, you'll get, you know, unobscured starlight from these galaxies in the ultra deep field. While with ALMA, with uh, this aspects survey, uh, you're actually getting uh, rest frame infrared, you're getting the dust emission, you're getting starlight that is actually obscured by dust and reprocessed into rest frame infrared. So you learn a lot about the galaxies contained in your deep field. Um, the only thing is that deep fields by themselves don't really get at the cosmic web. Um, you can see this uh, plot from the Madame Dickinson Star Formation Review. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, and you know all these other kinds of deep or wide fields overlay on top of this uh, uh, dark matter simulation uh, snapshot at Redshift Two, and you can see that this is almost kind of a pencil beam uh, in relation to the large scale voids and filaments that make up the you know large scale structure at this redshift. And I would argue that this is a problem if we want to learn about cosmic processes that kind of propagate across the cosmic web. Um, in particular, when we're trying to fill in the really big picture of uh, you know, these blanks in cosmic history. Um, now, the initial conditions of our universe at this point are really well characterized by CMB observations. The modern universe is really well characterized by surveys like Sloan, and of course DESI is already you know churning out lots of spectra, and these kinds of experiments are you know basically resolving the dark energy dominated cosmic web very well. But the story of the standard model of cosmology is not just we have the CMB and then we have the dark energy dominated cosmic web. You start off in this high energy phase, and then things start cooling down. You have recombination, uh, you have the afterglow of the CMB and lots of neutral baryonic matter. And then you eventually have gravitational collapse that leads to the first luminous cosmic structures that eventually reionize all this neutral hydrogen. And you know, basically these bubbles of ionized matter grow and grow until uh, you end up with the whole universe becoming transparent. And it's worth noting, of course, that this entire process of, you know, Combination, dark reionization is within the first billion years of the Big Bang. And then that sets the stage for the next dozen billion years of the matter dominated universe. And in particular, we think that star formation activity probably peaks within the first several billion years of cosmic history. So you've got reionization. Um, and there are lots of open questions still 
about how randomization happened. We don't have a precise determination of basically what were the first luminous cosmic structures. Were they rare bright objects with really low escape fractions? Or were they numerous faint proto-galaxies? This is still up for debate. And then you also want to find out what the environments of these proto-galaxies were, you know, how hot, how dusty, how metallic, et cetera. And then even after reionization, I would say we really haven't pinned down the arc of star formation history, you know, how much star formation happens, uh, when it peaks, when it declines. A uh, term that seems to have gained currency in recent times is cosmic noon to denote the peak of cosmic star formation density, but there isn't really a precise determination of when that cosmic noon is. The point is there are all these different cosmic processes that are lining up the cosmic web, uh, where there are lots of open questions uh, that remain unresolved. And that means we really need to look beyond deep field surveys to get the full cosmic picture uh, on a true sort of uh, population scale. We need square degrees, not square minutes, it is kind of the point here. So basically, yes, um, we have you know, these deep field surveys that allow us to sample faint distant galaxies and all kinds of wavelengths, but these don't really measure large scale structure. The conventional surveys that do measure large scale structure um, have been quite successful with, you know, redshift zero to one galaxies, but they're going to become really inefficient with faint distant galaxies. And then you also have, you know, these cosmic background surveys, CMB surveys, as well as surveys of the cosmic infrared background, which is mostly dominated uh, by you know, dusty star from galaxies at redshift uh, one to three or so. Um, the issue with those surveys is, um, although they are reasonably successful, uh, they don't really provide a three-dimensional picture of, of cosmic history. The CIB, for example, you know, this is a continuum, you know, this is a photometric broadband measurement. You are going to have degeneracies between redshift and luminosity, and so you're not always going to be able to discriminate between different kinds of cosmic star formation history models. So the common thread here is that we're really looking to characterize faint uh, galaxy populations uh, that are potentially contributing to reionization, cosmic star formation, galaxy assembly, and so forth, but across wider fields than these kinds of deep field surveys are doing. And this is where the idea of line testing mapping comes in. So instead of looking at broadband imagery as with like a CIB analysis, we'll do spectroscopy. And we're going to set the frequency bands of that spectroscopic imagery such that we'll be looking at redshifted emission in certain atomic and molecular lines. So this plot, I think, is from an Astro 2010 white paper. Uh, ignore that fact for a minute. I want you to focus on the lines in this hypothetical high redshift galaxy, SED. So you know, there's C2, for example, single NS carbon, rest frequency of 1.9 terahertz. Uh, there are also these CO lines, rotational transitions, uh, coming in a whole ladder, 115 gigahertz, 230 gigahertz, 345 gigahertz. Um, and all these different lines are redshifted because this galaxy has redshift 5, so C plus has been redshifted to 300 gigahertz, CO 1 to 0 to 19 gigahertz, and so on. Uh, and of course, if it were redshift 5.5, you'd see them as slightly lower frequencies, slightly longer wavelengths. Basically, the point is, if you had a three-dimensional data cube with deep enough integration, what you see is the fluctuations in the integrated line emission tracing the galaxies, tracing the large scale structure. Um, and your requirements on spatial or spectral resolution in measuring that line emission fluctuation is not given by kind of confusion. We're fine with confusion of individual objects. We just need to resolve the clustering of the emission, basically. So um, I'll get into what I mean by that in a second, but first let me sort of elucidate what these you know, different lines are really doing. Um, so you know, if you've heard of intensity mapping before, chances are it's in the context of 21 centimeter mapping, uh, basically tracing neutral hydrogen across the intergalactic medium. Um, this is a hyperfine transition. But um, in recent years, you know, we've really explored the idea of applying this kind of technique to CO lines, as well as the C2 line. You know, these are rotational transitions, fine structure transitions. It's all well and good to talk about the physical mechanisms, but I think it's probably more useful in the context of this tea talk to really sort of viscerally illustrate what these lines are tracing by looking at a local galaxy like, say, one of our satellites, the Large Magellanic Cloud. So on the left here, you have a Hubble image showing basically unobscured starlight from the LMC. 
on the right, you can see that what the 21 centimeter emission is tracing is not really the stars themselves, more sort of diffuse intergalactic, certain galactic medium uh, around and throughout the uh, LMC. H-alpha, by contrast, even though it's also a hydrogen line, it's a different line with a different mechanism. And so it's really tracing more so, actually, the unobscured star formation uh, than you can kind of see uh, you know, by comparing between your two different images here. And then CO1 to zero, what that's really tracing is the dense molecular gas um, that ultimately fuels star formation. But you can see that it's really not tracing regions of unobscured starlight. Rather, it tends to really trace sort of dusty regions, you know, metallic regions where the CO is sufficiently shielded from photo dissociation. Uh, so uh, in terms of, you know, looking at uh, higher shift galaxies, we tend to find that CO1 to zero correlates quite nicely with far infrared luminosity, which is to say basically obscure star formation rate. But the point is you need all of these different lines to get a complete picture of what's going on in, a gal in an individual galaxy like the LMC. And so it will be with process of ionization and galaxy assembly, you need multiple lines. Uh, you need intensity mapping in multiple lines in particular to be able to get a full picture of what's going on across the cosmic web at those high redshifts. I'll just shout out C2 because as I said, there's a lot of activity in C2 intensity mapping as well, even though this isn't really a C2 intensity mapping talk. You can kind of see that C2 is kind of really tracing mostly things that H alpha traces, um, but it's also really kind of a star formation line. C2 is complicated and weird, but it's basically tracing kind of the interface between the, the ionized and neutral phases of the ISM is kind of uh, maybe one way to put it. So coming back to this point about embracing the confusion, so to speak. So um, this is a figure we kind of fall back to a lot when we talk about uh, line testing mapping compared to the conventional sort of serendipitous galaxy surveys or line candidate searches. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a single redshift slice of the light cone about uh, two and a half square degrees. You can see all of these dots here in the simulation are, you know, different dark matter halos, hypothetically each of these hosting, you know, CO. Um, and basically the red dots are showing what's conceivably detectable with a large community instrument like the VLA. Um, and of course, you know, given the size of this field, you would need to spend thousands of hours on VLA, which you can't really get, realistically speaking. So a blind survey of CO emitting galaxies is not terribly feasible on a community instrument with the required resolution. But on the right, what you've got here is the aggregate CO flux, right? Uh, this is kind of the land testing map and target observable. And this is involved here with a five arc minute beam, which basically requires a single 10 meter dish rather than a massive interferometer. So even though you miss out on resolving the individual sources, what you get are the large scale fluctuations in CO flux. And importantly, you're not just tracing the brightest emitters, uh, but if you integrate deep enough and you do the proper analysis, you should be seeing the contribution from clusters and filaments of the faintest emitters as well. Now, it kind of sounds facetious to say you just need to integrate deep enough, but if all you need is a 10 meter dish and a really good focal plane, rather than like a massive interferometer, then thousands of hours of integration time is actually something you can almost apply for, so to speak. And again, note that this is a three-dimensional survey. You actually have line of sight information, so you can trace the evolution of CO flux across space and time. Now, uh, you know, as I said, um, this kind of idea of doing line intensity mapping has first, you know, first gained currency with the 21 centimeter line, uh, which is of course especially attractive uh, for granization epoch studies where you're directly mapping the neutral IGM. And so you're directly getting at the topology of these kinds of ionized bubbles. Um, so this has probably led to 21 centimeter being the biggest community, lots of collaborations, uh, you know, Chime, Hera and so forth. These are approaching mid-scale collaborations. Then you've got CONC2, which I've been speaking about. Um, and of course, H alpha, H beta, these uh, uh, rest frame optical star formation lines as well. Basically, um, you know, the right hand side of this here has really gained a lot of traction in the past decade. Um, you know, of course, you have SphereX looking at these optical star formation lines, but the niche I tend to work in principally is this CONC2 wheelhouse. In particular, I'm also involved with C2 experiments like Time and Cicat Prime, but again, this is not a C2 intensity mapping talk. I'll be focusing for the rem remainder of this talk in CO map. 
But hopefully this gives you an idea of the kind of landscape that CMAP fits into and what motivates the whole project. So I think you'll agree that it's a well-named project. It's a very descriptive name. Uh, CMAP is a project all about building single dish footprint arrays to do land testing mapping of CO at high redshift. Um, as I said, CO traces principally dense molecular gas, cold molecular gas uh, that's residing typically in the core of photon dominated regions. It's the most bright common tracer of molecular gas that we have since H2 doesn't really emit. Um, and the previous line candidate searches on VLA and ALMA have been successful in constraining the luminosity function to some extent in that they've really probed at the knee and the bright end of luminosity function, but they've left the feigned end fairly unconstrained. So this is where we hope to come in with line testing mapping to trace the emission from both faint and bright populations and constrain the faint end in that sense. Now, I think I briefly mentioned that CO emits in a whole ladder of lines. So what I'm showing on the right here is the observed frequency of the different CO lines as a function of redshift. And what we ultimately want to study is shown here, this redshift 6 to 8 e block marinization. Um, but if we want to figure out uh, you know, the feasibility of CO and testing mapping, uh, a pathfinder phase is really vital uh, to be able to prove that we can build sufficiently sensitive spectrometers and that we can build sufficiently high quality pipelines to reduce those data to science with this line testing mapping technique. So the pathfinder phase is really going after a much brighter signal uh, this CO1 to zero retro three here that's coming from very near the peak cosmic star formation activity, uh, which of course is interesting in and of itself. Uh, it's coming from this epoch of galaxy assembly where you know we start to get more recognizable galaxies. So for one, observing in this band lets us access this signal, which is interesting in its own right. And additionally, you know we're acting as a proving ground with the pathfinders acting as a proving ground for technologies and techniques that we will need to access this higher redshift signal in the future. Uh, where we want to, you know, have K band instrumentation builds, build out K band instrumentation, and cross correlate between these two CO lines to get a really robust uh, measurement of reionization epoch molecular gas. And of course, this observation here, the pathfinder observation, still does have that high redshift signal buried in it. So we can principally potentially extract or set limits on that through further observations or analysis. So uh, we want a collaboration together here, uh, by which I mean here in happier pre-pandemic pre times in front of the actual instrument. So uh, Caltech is where RPI is based, Kieran Clary, who I think is on Zoom. Um, and Caltech also operates the Owens Valley Radio Observatory where the instrument is hosted. Um, collaborators at all these other institutions have been providing crucial support in instrumentation, analysis, modeling, uh, both on primary and secondary CMAP science. Um, and of course, we've been generously funded by the National Science Foundation. I think I left out the award number here from our most recent proposal cycle, which funds uh, the Pathfinder through the end of 2024, at least. Um, and then we also had general seed funding from the Tech Institute at Caltech, as well as Kaipak at Stanford. So um, as I said, uh, we came up with this series of early science papers. Uh, these were announced on archive last November, um, and they cover basically every aspect of the Pathfinder from the instrument itself, to the pipeline, uh, to the line tester map science, and also some galactic science that we were able to do with the instrument, because of course it's a very sensitive K-man instrument. Uh, it makes sense to go after some galactic science uh, when the line tester map fields aren't up. Um, and then these were accepted by AppJ and published in this very nice focus issue that the journal put together for us uh, in July. Um, so I think it's only sensible to start by describing the actual instrumentation of the Pathfinder. So this is a 19 pixel K band spectrometer hosted on a 10 meter dish. This is a dish. It used to be part of Karma before it was decommissioned. Um, so it's not, the telescope itself isn't designed for line test mapping science, but we did make a few modifications, including a new secondary reflector design. To, and you know, we also introduced some polarizers in the chain. So we, we've tried to mitigate things like optical standing waves that are uh, not uh, fun systematics to have in a line test mapping experiment. Uh, the receiver is placed at the secondary focus. Uh, so we have to have this ambient vein live right on the side of the weather shield. This comes in and out for regular measurement system, system temperature, provides pretty good relative calibration. The detectors themselves are 
uh, mimic uh, low noise amplifiers, coherent amplifiers. The noise temperature of the detectors themselves is around 10K uh, on, on the telescope uh, with contributions from spillover and atmosphere and so forth. Uh, total system temperature tends to be around 40 to 50 K. I think median is around 44 K. Uh, and there are various down conversion steps, obviously, saddlebacks with you know, analog down conversion, sideband folding up. But um, the actual sideband separation and the spectrometry at the end is all digital. We have you know, basically a mess of wires connecting everything up to 38 roach boards, uh, performing pretty well. And this digital backend is really what enables us to have uh, 19 feeds all looking at 26 to 34 gigahertz with a native resolution of two megahertz, which is way overkill for the line of network science, by the way. But we think this is basically the, you know, the largest simultaneous bandwidth processed by an astronomical spectrometer in existence. The survey itself uh, spans three fields. The effective size per field is four square degrees. You can see these pictured on top of the Planck 30 gigahertz map just to show that we avoid the most obvious point sources. Um, and also to show that uh, our fields for the most part overlap with the HEPDEX survey. This is an untargeted survey of Lyman alpha emitters uh, across a few hundred square degrees. The, their redshift range is gonna be two to three and a half. Uh, they're operating from the Northern hemisphere. So overall, a uh, pretty good bargain in terms of getting overlap with them and eventually uh, getting to cross correlate with those Lyman alpha emitters. Our fields are also chosen to overlap with the uh, Sloan footprint. So uh, Delaney Dunn, who's a PhD student over there at Caltech, um, has been working on uh, an exercise stacking our early science data on uh, EBOS quasars, for example. So those kinds of analyses are possible. The zero deck field also lies on top of Stripe 82, which is quite nice for other ancillary data as well. Of course, we've also selected these fields for other considerations, including observing efficiency, cross-linking, and so on. Uh, the nominal Pathfinder survey is supposed to go for five years. Uh, so we underwent commissioning uh, in spring, summer of 2019. We began our observing campaign in July of 2019. And as I said, the first season spans the first 13 months of observing uh, through the end of July 2020, when the receiver had to come down for maintenance. Apart from maintenance operations, CLMAP is basically in continuous operation on that uh, dedicated 10 meter dish. So um, let's start talking about the actual survey data. And part of understanding the survey data is about understanding how we go about scanning the fields. So of course, you know, the, the spectrometer, there's no scanning involved. It's a, you know, it's simultaneous coverage across the whole band. But of course, we need to scan across the sky. And the sensible thing to do, of course, would be constant elevation scans. So that's what's pictured in the lower panel here. You basically catch up to the field, you say, okay. Uh, scan in azimuth, keep the elevation constant, let the field drift through. Oh, the field has moved over enough that we need to step over, keep scanning in azimuth, uh, scan at a slightly lower elevation because the field is setting, and so on and so on and so forth as the field sets. So by doing a constant elevation scan, you minimize the ways in which ground-based systematics, atmospheric fluctuations mix into your time stream. So this is a fairly sensible strategy. Um, However, it does kind of limit the ways in which the focal plane, you know, the different feeds on the focal plane cross into and out of the field. And so if you want improved cross-linking, that in and of itself uh, could potentially encourage a more complex pattern like what's on the top panel here, the spirograph in a square looking thing uh, that we internally call the list you scan pattern. And you can see that, you know, this is going to let the focal plane cross through the field at many, many different angles. But it is also going to you know, mix your ground-based system and to mix your atmosphere in a much more complex way. So one of the things we wanted to find out from the early science analysis was, is this really feasible? Can we, can we get away with list your scans? Uh, the short answer, by the way, is no. But you know, uh, it was worth a try at the time. I don't know how I enabled text annotation. But OK, we're back. So here's a really high level overview of the pipeline. We have level one data. Um, this goes through, gets chopped up into scans. Each, uh, the whole, you know, the data are in like OBS ID segments of around one hour each. And each OBS ID is composed of several scans, roughly 10 minutes each. So it's gets cut up into scans, gets fed into OBS database. Um, the level one data get filtered and reduced down to level two data. 
And then those level two data undergo more cuts and basically get made into maps, at which point we can start doing power spectrum estimation. Um, you can kind of see that this is not really dissimilar to a CME pipeline, which makes sense on two accounts. One, our collaborators at Oslo who developed this pipeline have lots of experience looking at CMB data like Quiet and Plunk. The other way in which this makes sense is that a lot of the uh, aspirations and problems that we run into as a CO line test mapping experiment at 30 gigahertz, they are quite similar to the kinds of aspirations and problems CMB surveys run into. We're still trying to get at you know, one part in a million fluctuations. In fact, um, <clears throat> you know, the systematics uh, a lot of times can't be modeled perfectly a priori, so oftentimes PCA is the best way to go. We're still really, really scared of spillover. It's really, really, you know, a worrisome source of non-thermal error for us. And so we, you know, the pipeline is geared towards suppressing spillover as much as possible at every step, including in hardware design to some extent. Uh, our map making is not maximum likelihood. It's filtered in bin like SPT. Um, our galactic science colleagues at Manchester, they, I think, do maximum likelihood with, with the striping. But uh, for line test mapping, map making, it's filtered in bin. And then you know, we undertake a pseudo power spectrum method, much like a pseudo CFL method for CMB. The main difference and the main sort of increase in combinational load comes from the fact that now we're looking at lots and lots of different channels. As I said, the raw resolution is two megahertz. And even though we ultimately reduce things down to 32 megahertz, you're still looking at 256 different channels. So, um, in terms of describing the pipeline, what I really focus on is how we clean the data with the filtering steps between the level one data and the level two data. There are four filtering steps involved, uh, and none of this really takes advantage of any kind of time uh, domain correlation. Um, so the first step is a per channel filter where you just normalize the time stream by a rolling mean, basically. You low pass filter the TOD, and then that's, a, that's your rolling mean. You divide up by the rolling mean, subtract one, and then you're left over with fluctuations by the mean. The second filter that's been done per channel is a ground template subtraction. So kind of say, OK, ground contamination, atmospheric variation, you kind of expect it to be roughly scaling with air mass and with maybe azimuth linearly. Um, and so you do a multilinear fit of the TOD against air mass and the azimuth. You can see for this example plot from the pipeline paper, we use the 10-minute list you scan. So you can see the variation of the TOD with elevation, and you can see that a lot of it is subtracted out at this ground template subtraction step. The third step, we actually finally start taking advantage of some correlations. Um, so per feed, per sideband, uh, we take all the time streams in that sideband, and at each point in time, we fit a linear fit to the spectrum. We call it the polyfilter, but we just use a first order polynomial, so it's just a linear fit, and we subtract that fit away at each point in time. So this is really intended to subtract continuum foregrounds, basically, things like the CMB, um, you know, galactic emission, uh, radio galaxies, potentially. But it turns out it also ends up removing a lot of 1 over F gain fluctuations, which is quite nice. And then the final step is really we take all of the time streams all together, we feed it into PCA, and we subtract typically the first four or so PCA components. And you can see. And at the end of all of that, time stream basically kind of looks like white noise, which is what we want for the most part at you know a 10 minute scan level. Um, just to show more explicitly how well we reject the correlated noise uh, on a per scan basis, you know this is the power spectral density before uh, you know any of the filtering, uh, and then here's after the filtering. Obviously, this doesn't really do much because you're just subtracting out the rolling mean or dividing it out rather. Uh, and then the ground template subtraction, in this case, again, is a list of scan. So there's considerable harmonic associated with the, with the scan frequency that we subtract when we subtract the ground template. And the poly filter actually cuts out a lot of the 1RF noise, and the PCA filter seems to get rid of the rest. How much the poly filter gets rid of, the, uh, how much 1RF the poly filter gets rid of versus the PCA filter uh, depends on a scan by scan basis, you know, things like weather and so forth influence the balance of that. But basically, yes, we seem to have a filtering pipeline that strongly rejects correlated noise on a per scan basis. Um, now, there's other data processing beyond that that is necessary before we uh, go to map making. We need to cut on various other 
housekeeping variables. We have to mask out certain frequency channels that show really high system temperature and so forth. Uh, but by and large, you know, this is the kind of thing we're working with as we go. There we go. So uh, we filter data, we make cuts, we build maps, and then we don't actually just co-add the map across all feeds and take the power for the map uh, or the cube. Rather, um, our collaborators at Oslo devise what they call the feed feed to the cross spectrum method. And so we cross correlate between different splits of the data uh, to obtain a robust measurement of the CO signal. So you can imagine you have a split of the data that's just feed one high elevation, feed one low elevation, feed two high elevation, feed two low elevation, given some kind of elevation threshold. And you can see you have 38 splits of the data. And you can cross correlate between the disjoint feed and the elevation splits. You know, if you cross correlate between a high elevation split and low elevation split, the ground contamination should be disjoint and the CO signal should be shared. So that cross correlation, uh, if you average across a number of these cross spectra, that should be a robust estimator for the CO autocorrelation in that given field. Now, um, we don't correct for mode mixing at the current point in time, at this current point in time, uh, mostly because simulations have indicated, as shown here, that it should be a pretty modest effect. Our peak sensitivity is tr tr principally around here, and you can see that you know it, it's already below thirty percent on average here. And it really doesn't rise above 10, 20 percent uh, at higher K values. So we don't consider in lethal given that our sensitivity for PFK is pretty low from season one data. This was this is something we will need to consider in future, however, as we continue to integrate down. You can think about twisting this technique around to do a null test. Basically, if you have disjoint splits in feed and field, and then you cross correlate between splits of the same elevation range. Now you're kind of doing the opposite thing. You're uh, rejecting the common CO signal. And if you've cleaned your data systematic sufficiently, you should be getting a null result. This is what happens for the CES scans, the constant elevation scans. However, for the list use scans, you can see that some of these are definitely not consistent with zero. Some of these have significant deviations and indicate something is going on uh, once we rise up above the foam. In fact, uh, if you look at the paper, we show PTEs and it definitely falls below 1% for some of these null tests. So the null test scale for the list data, something's definitely rising out of the noise. Um, once we do power spectrum estimation across all year one data, things look consistent with white noise on a per scan level. Things look consistent with white noise if you, for example, plot the distribution of you know, you know, uh, voxel temperatures in the quadrant maps. But there's something in power spectrum space. There's some kind of large scale system that's going on. So we all, for the early science results, we discard all of this two data. And since the constant elevation scan data passed the null test, we use that for our science results. And we obtain basically these feed views to the cross spectra shown both for the individual fields and then combined across all the fields. This is unsurprisingly consistent with zero for now. Uh, we don't have a statistically significant measurement and we can actually use this to provide an upper limit on the CO power spectrum at these weight numbers. So um, this is where the paper I led comes in, uh, where we start talking about line testing mapping uh, constraints on high range of CO based on this measurement. So this is our upper limit. And what I'm showing here is basically wave number versus K times K of K. So basically the power spectrum, just scale by single power of K. And you can see a couple of things. First, um, this is not the only line testing mapping observation. Uh, CO map, to be clear, is the only dedicated uh, CO line testing mapping experiment that's in operation. However, uh, you can see there is this data point COPS, which is also a line testing mapping observation. Uh, this was done uh, by Carter Keating and collaborators with the SZA, which again was part of Karma before it was decommissioned. And you can see that because it was used an interferometer, uh, it's really focusing on higher wave numbers. So it's really probing a different regime of the CO power spectrum. It's complementary with CO map. I'll go into a bit more detail on that a little bit. But basically what you can see is as well is that we're plotting all these different models from the literature for the CO power spectrum alongside the CO map upper limit. And you can see that our upper limit is capable of excluding a number of models that previously would be consistent or mostly consistent with this two and a half sigma result from COPS. 
the remainder of the models in the literature, we expect to be able to reliably detect or exclude by the end of the five year Pathfinder campaign. You can see our sort of one sigma limit forecast for year five, as well as some selected uh, single noise forecasts uh, average across all weight numbers in this case. So um, as I said, COPS and CMAP probe different regimes. Uh, CMAP is basically the first direct three-dimensional constraint on the clustering of CO1 to zero emissivity at the redshift three. Uh, now, why is that important? Why is it important that we measure clustering uh, as well as shot noise? Well, it's because these basically, you can think of these as probing different moments of the CO luminosity function at this redshift. So the shot noise kind of probes the second moment of the luminosity function. It's probing basically stochasticity, uh, the bright end, uh, the, the sort of shape of the luminosity function overall. The clustering is more the sort of average CO emissivity, which is kind of basically the CO average line temperature, uh, scaled by the linear bias of CO as a tracer of matter, and then of course the matter power spectrum. So this is really getting at you know, the galaxy halo connection, the connection between the dark matter halos and the CO content of the galaxy that they host in this kind of scaled average CO emissivity that is associated with the clustering amplitude. And you can see that we have improved on the indirect constraint on the clustering amplitude from COPS by about an order of magnitude. Uh, well, basically this is a single power of TV, but then the clustering amplitude is roughly TV squared. So this factor of three or four basically ends up translating to a factor of an order of magnitude in the clustering amplitude. You can see there were some other constraints uh, from various cross correlation exercises that are also you know, not uh, nearly as constraining as this upper limit. Future data, especially with cross correlation with the head tech survey should yield considerably bounded constraints on this TV parameter. And just to show the complementarity between CMF and COPS, you can see that COP, you know, the if you look at the primary space for clustering amplitude versus shot noise amplitude, you can see that this kind of this is kind of what COPS carves out. Um, you get basically a much better bounded constraint on the shot noise amplitude, but then a fairly open constraint on the clustering amplitude, whereas CMF doesn't really constrain the shot noise amplitude much better than COPS but it certainly constrains the clustering amplitude much better. So this way, you know, if you do a joint analysis of the COPS data points with the CMAP season one data points, you get bounded constraint on the shot noise and you get a nice upper limit on the clustering amplitude. Now, if you want to infer physical quantities from this clustering amplitude, there is something that gets in the way, which is that your physical quantities, like say like the cosmic electrical gas density, rho H2, this is really proportional to just average T. Um, it doesn't really depend on TB, which is a combination of this average line emissivity with the linear bias of CO. Uh, in this case, however, you know, we have not just been working on analyzing data, we've also been looking at improving our modeling. Uh, and all of our modeling priors really strongly favor uh, you know, certain steepness to the relation between halo mass and CO luminosity, which ends up translating to basically a lower limit on the linear bias of CO as a tracer of matter. And that allows us to translate our upper limit on TB into an upper limit on average T, the average line temperature, which is ultimately going to be able to, we're going to, be able to translate into a constraint on rho H2 by assuming uh, some kind of fiducial CO luminosity uh, to H2 mass conversion. In future, we won't have to rely on modeling priors to try and get a better idea on the bias. Uh, Patrick Bracey has been a you know, great advocate of one-point statistics for uh, line testing mapping contexts. And you know, basically, one-point statistics, uh, by looking at the voxel line tensor distribution and future CMAP data, we should be able to break this kind of degeneracy between intensity or temperature and the line bias. Uh, so that is for year five. This is what we have currently for year one. So this is our upper limit on row H2 at redshift three. On its face, you know, best thing we can say about it is it's certainly consistent with the other data points that are on here. But if you do look at the other data points on here a little more closely, you can see it's kind of bifurcating a little bit. Um, so let me explain a bit on that. 
So these surveys here, aspects FIPS2, cold Z, these are line candidate searches. FIPS2 was more much more of a serendipitous search. Aspects and cold Z, they set out to look for line candidates in deep fields. Um, and they arrive at this kind of OH2 based on the sources that they're able to source or line candidates that they're able to detect. COPS and MIME. COPS, I explained before. MIME is a similar experiment. Uh, this is this data point is based on all the compact array observations of higher JCO lines. And you can see that the line intensity mapping experiments, all of these are both interferometric, and so they're constrained on row H2 is the best indirect. These are really clustering towards higher numbers, higher, but higher best estimates for row H2. So it's interesting. Potentially, we are actually seeing uh, the ability of line intensity mapping to capture contributions from fainter populations of galaxies that wouldn't be resolved by things like aspects and cold set. But regardless, you can see that CO map year five forecasts show that we should be able to quite confidently disambiguate uh, between models that are consistent with these two different scenarios of higher versus lower molecular gas density at Russia 3. So um, I'm going to start wrapping up. And the first thing I need to wrap up on is, you know, what are the takeaways from early science? with COMAP, with the Pathfinder in particular. So do we have a statistically significant measurement? No, but that's actually really good news. Um, so we've demonstrated that we can field this really sensitive uh, large bandwidth spectrometer. And we've demonstrated that we can pair it with a really nice pipeline that produces clean data that's consistent with white noise, given the amount of integration time that we will achieve. And even at this early stage, we have an upper limit that constrains the CO signal in some meaningful way, we're already excluding certain models in the literature that used to be more consistent with COPS. Of course, with future data, we're going to have lower no white noise levels. We're going to have potentially other systematics rising up out of the foam. Um, you know, we are already underway discussing some of the data that have come out, you know, that have been taken since the end of season one. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but suffice it to say, our collaborators at Oslo are not standing still. They are continuing to refine the pipeline, uh, tweaking the filtering in order to basically step up to the increased requirements for cleaning that are going to be required with these future noise levels. Uh, thankfully, the fundamental thing, which is really about getting the extra integration time in the first place, won't be a problem since uh, the NSF uh, have, have uh, thankfully funded us to complete the full five-year Pathfinder survey. But of course, we're also looking beyond the Pathfinder survey. Uh, you know, this Pathfinder system is just one dish, uh, 19 feet. We're already discussing trying to expand out the K advantage implementation across multiple dishes, as well as potentially building K advantage rotation. Uh, to that end, we've also actually already uh, negotiated an agreement with NRAO. Uh, they're working on this NGVLA prototype antenna picture here, and we have an agreement that that will be dedicated to COMAP. Once uh, they are, once NRAO are done with their testing, sometime around 2025 or 2026. So now we just need to fund the receiver to put on it. But once that's done, and once this kind of CMF EOR concept is operating, we should be actually able to undertake CO clustering and abundance measurements all the way from cosmic noon uh, out to cosmic dawn or randomization epoch. So. Uh, basically, I hope I've conveyed to you that line testing mapping fills a really interesting niche. Uh, in the middle of all these conventional uh, galaxy surveys. Uh, it is going to be a really important way to characterize the total contribution of both faint and bright populations of galaxies. In particular, uh, the CMI Pathfinder uh, has you know, demonstrated you know, early science results that are really promising. Uh, it seems to be on track to map CO fluctuations out at Redshift 3. Uh, we're funded through at least 2024 and future phases have been proposed, are being proposed. They are looking for funding. Uh, I believe Patrick Bracey is scheduled for an Astro T talk at Caltech in December. And uh, you can, if you're interested in hearing more about randomization epoch CO map, uh, you should potentially tune into his talk later in the year. But uh, the last thing I want to convey really is, you know, that you can't just have CO map. You can't just have 21 centimeter press mapping. Uh, you need all of these different line of test mapping experiments working together as an ensemble. And that's what's going to be able to provide really powerful probes of the topology organization and probes of the environments 
of these proto galaxies that uh, are the first luminous structures of our universe. So I will wind down there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Darren. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Uh, is there any question from the audience offline, online? Are you in team? Go ahead. Hi. Hi, hey, Don. Very nice talk. So I have a question about, so have you guys tried to quantify like, like if your cosmological signal will be lost in your filtering process? Um, yes. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a backup slide that shows it, but we do uh, simulate transfer functions uh, with respect to both you know, instrumental effects like the beam smoothing, as well as uh, filtering with the pipeline. Um, we think that the amount lost is, you know, it's not it's not catastrophic. It's not like an order of magnitude loss in the in the signal. Um, so the filtering uh, seems to be not too harsh in that respect. Um, again, uh, for the early science results, uh, you know, our sensitivity to the our spectrum obviously is not at a level where we are worrying in great detail about how much signal is removed since currently we're consistent with white noise. Uh, but certainly we'll continue to, you know, iterate on simulations as we also iterate on the pipeline to continue to characterize the transfer function from the pipeline really well. I see. So are the signal loss from filtering mostly on large scales or is it actually all scales? Um, there's a bit of loss across uh, most of the wave number range, but yeah, there is also, yeah, uh, there's also a lot of loss uh, at both uh, uh, low K parallel and low K per. I see. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. We'll all get here. <laughs> oh, I line. So I, I think I don't show a transfer function, but basically, uh, yeah, just to add to that point, this this upturn at low K, that's coming from the transfer function loss at really, really large scales. Um, if that weren't there, we would just see the noise limit sort of flatten out at best. So just I just have a softball. Sure. Um, Dung, will, will there be a, a data release somewhere between year one and year five? You guys must already have several years in the can. Yeah, so this is something we've been discussing. I don't know how much um, I should say because I see Kieran's still online. Uh, but yeah, this is something we, we're certainly thinking about because, yeah, I mean, uh, I should mention, of course, we also have a, you know, data sharing agreement with Hetex that's in place. So uh, if certainly, you know, if there are interesting intermediate results, you know, from that collaboration, as well as just from increased integration time that requires, you know, massive change to the pipeline, we'd certainly be interested in potentially putting out papers, but uh, no firm plans right now, but certainly uh, not impossible. Sure. Yeah, you know, Mark, to go ahead and meet yourself. I don't. Know. I was just wondering, um, have the recent results from JWST, the, uh, the more galaxies than I expected that have shift, had any influence on, on the models? That's a good question. I haven't had the time to really think deeply about it, but certainly, I mean, it's interesting to think if if these gal if these galaxies are you know more disk like, uh, more dusty, more resemble, you know, resemble lower mesh galaxies more than we previously thought, that would certainly be of interest. Um, I personally want to see the JWST calibrations stabilize a bit more. Maybe they have already stabilized as far as, you know, um, but um, certainly there's a lot of analysis uh, steps uh, for JWST data that are still in flux. So. I was, I'm, I'm currently still being a bit cautious in terms of translating those new data into uh, revised expectations for CO, but certainly something to watch for, yes. I mean, you would think it's seeing that uh, so far the all the implicit mechanism has been pointing to more stuff and yep. uh, it's not a crazy thing 
to imagine that you should modify them all. So. No, it's not crazy at all. But there, there's just there's just some data reduction that seems to remain to be shaken out. So that's all. Thanks. Okay, so sorry, another question. So uh, I was wondering how how you handle the the continual emission or the interloper lines. Yeah, interloper, I guess, is probably inevitable because it's from the background, but but like the continuum, how do you filter all the signal? So the continuum we tend to say that the polyfilter step. Um, well, this doesn't really show it explicitly, but since the polyfilter step is basically a fit in frequency space that we take out at each point in time, we say that should basically remove it. Um, we've seen we you know based on some you know internal analyses, we certainly think that this should be sufficient to remove continuum four rounds by several orders of magnitude, and we're working on improvements to filtering to uh, imp improve that removal even further. Um, so that's the chief way in which we mitigate continuum four rounds in the data. In terms of interloper lines, yes, the current expectation is that interloper emission from things like HCN is going to be quite negligible, mm -hmm. or at least subdominant. Right. Okay. Thanks. Looks like there's no more questions. Okay, then uh, let's thank Tom again. Evan Law, thanks for a great talk. Let's see you all next week.